don't know me yet, um, I'm Teresa Long. I'm a PGY2 resident, and I'm really excited to present to you a case. I'm giving away all of the story, but um, a case of a 12-year-old boy that I saw who was entrapped on call. And so as a resident, this was the first time that I had ever seen um, entrapment, and it was um, an exciting case and a good learning case for me. So uh, we had a 12-year-old male. He presented to a primary children's ED after he was referred from an outside emergency room. Um, and he was playing flag football and his friend's head collided with his right eye. He had no loss of consciousness. Um, he immediately had double vision after the injury, went home with his parents after the injury, iced his eye for about two and a half hours, had an episode of vomiting, and then his parents said, well, maybe he had a concussion. Let's bring him back to the ED. Um, and then outside of the emergency room, um, they um, discovered that he couldn't, um, he had no changes in his vision, but at the outside emergency, sorry, room, they basically did a CT scan and then sent him to primaries. So um, really, his dad had keratoconus, his uncle had a lazy eye, but no significant past um, medical history or surgical history. His vision was great, he had no APD, um, but his extraocular movements, he was minus three and a half in infraduction in that right eye and minus four um, in superduction. And otherwise, his um, examination was completely normal. Um, and then on slit lamp examination, he had some mild eyelid edema on the right eye. There was no subconjunctival hemorrhage, and the posterior examination was uh, within normal limits as well. So uh, we reviewed the CT scans. Um, I said, oh my gosh, he cannot move his eye. This must be what entrapment looks like. Um, and then just uh, highlighting some images. I think I have a pointer. No, I don't. Um, so you can just see that on the inferior floor, there's a very, very thin trapdoor fracture. Um, which explains his vision. And then one more um, image here, I think this is probably the most obvious. Um, so radiologically, it looks like he's also entrapped as well as clinically. So we have a 12-year-old boy has a right inferior trapdoor fracture. Um, he has no evidence of open globe compartment syndrome or tra traumatic hyphema or posterior segment injury, um, but he's entrapped. So what do we do now? So I kind of had some questions. Uh, how soon does my patient need to go to the OR? Does the timing of his operative intervention affect his long-term outcomes? And then what post-operative complications can be expected um, as we go forward as kind of some learning points for me. So um, orbital floor fractures in children, just a brief review. So they're 35, three to 45% of all pediatric facial fractures. Um, and pediatric orbital injuries have unique patterns. So interestingly, in kids less than seven, um, involvement of the orbital roof is more common, and then once they get past seven, they tend to have more floor and medial wall injuries. And this is because as kids grow, their sinuses um, fill with air, and um, their anatomy changes, and so the pattern of injury tends to be different. Um, and then, typically, um, children can have diplopia or ocular motility limitations, and without evidence of, pardon me, globe trauma. And so this is this term that I hadn't heard before, um, learning this case of the white-eyed blowout fracture. So kids are less likely to present with subconch hemorrhages and chemosis, and externally they look like they're normal, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't have a big problem. Um, they talk about the oculocardiac reflex. Several papers have talked about this as a triad, but typically the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve um, is affected, and the visceral motor, motor nucleus of the vagus nerve um, are connected and that causes um, bradycardia. The presence of nausea and vomiting has a positive predictive value of 83% for an inferior rectus entrapment in the presence of an documented trapdoor fracture. Um, so asking about nausea and vomiting um, in a kid is really important when assessing fractures. Um, and adults, you know, in contrast, tend to have a ton of swelling, bruising, subconch hemorrhage, and double vision when they present, it's not quite as obvious. So uh, if you don't follow the pediatric literature, this paper just came out in December, um, and I'm really excited. I have a lot of information on the slides, but it was a great review. It was really comprehensive. So this was a, a retrospective review of pediatric patients less than 18 years old. Um, over a 15-year period, this was done in India, and they documented um, the cause of injury, imaging findings, clinical features, and management. You can see the outcomes that they measured. They had 52 patients in this study. Interestingly, 75% of them were male um, pediatric patients. And um, their mean age at presentation was about 11 years old, um, so about the same age as our patient. The most common cause of injury in this study, 35% of them was road traffic accidents, 
um, which is interesting because in India they talked about how seat belts and car seats are not as commonly used, um, but the patterns of injury changed. So as the pediatric patients got older, injury from assault tended to be more common, and injury from sports was more common in males than females. Um, then the orbital floor was the most common site of injury, and trapdoor fracture was seen in almost half of the patients with the pediatric population. Most of them had double vision. The majority of patients presented with no or mild visual impairment, and um, a lot of them, 81% of them, had some degree of ocular motility restriction. Vomiting was the most common systemic complaint, and then they tracked how many patients went to the surgery. Um, so entrapment was the most common cause for them to go to the OR. And there was a discussion of implants and how to repair, but that is a big topic that needs more time than today. So their outcomes um, was 2020 to NLP, and what's interesting is the visual acuity that the kids presented with tended to be the visual acuity that they, um, they finished with after surgery. Um, so the damage was kind of done from the initial injury. The NLP eyes, there were like two or three, and they were really traumatic, like bilateral injuries for these patients. Um, if they're conservatively managed, their diplopia decreased. The enophthalmos persisted in all patient, patients, traumatic ptosis improved, and um, they all, all patients in general got better. So, and then they noticed that if they had surgical intervention within 15 days, they had complete resolution of, of their diplopia. Um, so what about trapdoor fractures specifically? Um, so typically, classically, a trapdoor fracture is a linear, medially hinged, but minimally displaced fracture that classically runs along the infraorbital canal. Um, they have been compromised, known to compromise about 27 to 93% of cases of pediatric orbital floor fractures. And the big thing is you have to worry about ischemia of the entrapped intraocular muscle, and that down the road can lead to Volkmann's ischemic contracture, something that orthopedic surgeons often note. There's two theories of how this happens, the hydraulic mechanism and the buckling mechanism. So the hydraulic mechanism, this increased intraorbital pressure, puts direct compression on the fracture of the bony floor or the buckling mechanism where the force is transmitted posteriorly through the orbital rim and then translatedly buckles and fractures the orbital floor. So why do we get trapped or fractures in kids? Well, um, they have more elastic bones, essentially. And so the, you have the fracture that happens um, with the force transduction backwards, and then the bone automatically snaps back so much quicker. And this is different in adults because you have mineralized bone, they're more fragile, and then you get open door fractures with herniation of tissues. So when do we take kids to the OR? Um, obviously, entrapment is one of the biggest ones. They have ocular motility restriction, causing double vision. They have a positive ocular cardiac reflex. Early enophthalmos, a large defect, um, or if long later down the road, they have non-resolving double vision. Lost my timer. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so what post-operative complications? So double vision is the most common one. Um, that I was worried about for my patient, and they noted that in children with trapdoor fractures, double vision may be more common, um, probably due to the ischemic injury that happens, um, and then there are some more in infrequent um, injuries. So I look back, and I was like, well, this is really interesting. Dr. Patel always tells us you have to know where you've been before you have to know where you're going to go. So um, Smith and Reagan in 57 first described this isolated fracture of the orbital floor with an intact orbital rim. And this was, of course, you know, before the time of imaging. So in 78, Putterman uh, hypothesized that the extraocular uh, muscle pathology was due to contusion, and this would resolve with time. And this was, um, this, uh, was the recommended observation for orbital blowout fractures in adults. And there's some note in the literature that this became misinterpreted as the need to observe um, orbital floor fractures. In the 80s, we got CT scans. Um, in 1991, Demand was the first to advise immediate surgery for pediatric orbital floor fractures with positive force duction tests. And then in 1998, this is where the terminology came from with Jordan for the white-eyed um, blowout fracture in pediatric patients. So you don't have this... Um, Basically, they, in this study, they noted faster improvement in ocular motility than kids that were operated in kids that were operated in two to four days as opposed to two weeks. And so they said, "Hey, maybe you need to take them to the OR sooner in two days." A lot of information on this slide, but essentially, from 2000 to now 2011, um, you can see the trend. So um, less than two weeks, and we're going to four, you know seven days, and then now surgical intervention as soon as the diagnosis is made. 
within 24 hours, within 48 hours. So the trend is taking patients um, to the OR sooner, at least in the last um, 15 years or so. Um, this study um, was one that actually objectively measured. It also came out uh, this year in 2018, um, and it was a plastic and reconstructive surgery journal, but they actually objectively measured patients' postoperative motility. Um, and they are put 28 children with unilateral orbital floor fractures with entrapment into two groups, those that went to the OR um, in 24 hours and those that went to the OR after 24 hours. ENT, opto, and facial plastic surgeries all took care of this patient, which makes sense with an academic institution. Um, CT was performed in all children. And what did they find? So essentially, there was no statistically significant difference in resolution of vertical motility deficits, but patients that had surgery within 24 hours had more fully recovered at the first and final post-op endpoints. Um, so increased likelihood of recovery of motility deficits if they went to the OR sooner within 24 hours. The last thing that I found, um, Dr. Mark has sent this paper to the residents when uh, we are learning, but um, what about CT imaging in the pediatric population? So it really underestimates uh, extraocular muscle and soft tissue entrapment, and so um, Parbu found that more than 50% of children with orbital fracture had entrapment when they went to the OR that was not appreciated by the radiologist. So this really suggests that entrapment is very much a clinical diagnosis. Um, you have to examine the patient, you have to look at their extraocular movements, and so that's something that in all patients that we see at primaries, we need to be seeing them and checking their EOMs if the ED doc doesn't do a good job. Um, in adults, though, in contrast, uh, CT is really highly sensitive and specific, um, and then it, down here I have some information on the concordance rates. So what were the key learning points for me from this case? This is my first case of entrapment. Um, so orbital fractures with entrapment are more likely to occur in children than adults with the elasticity of the bones. They're more likely to present with a white-eyed blowout fracture. So just because the kid looks normal doesn't mean that they don't have a problem. Um, CT scans may underestimate a fracture, especially in children. So clinical exam and ophthalmology consultation is essential. Um, the presence of nausea and vomiting is a, is a sensitive symptom for EOM entrapment in the presence of a uh, fracture. Um, and then to the ED doc, I would say, I found another paper that said up to a third of pediatric facial trauma patients, um, basically the, um, they presented with the, the oculocardiac reflex and this went under recognized by the ED doctor. Um, so if they have bradycardia, if they're having symptoms, this is something the ED doc needs to be aware of and they need to think about um, consulting ophthalmology and not attributing them to a concussion. And then timely repair is important. So surgery within 24 hours may lead to better outcomes. So I think I'm interested to see what further studies um, occur in my career. So, so what happened to our patient? Um, so he was taken to the OR for repair um, of his orbital floor trapdoor fracture with placement of Medport barrier sheet. He went within 24 hours. Um, we got him to the OR the next morning. Um, and as you can see, so I have post-op one, day one, two, uh, three, post-op week two, and post-op month one, his, di his diplopia resolved um, and his extraocular movements are improved. So uh, here are my references. What questions do you have for me? So <clears throat> we got people here from Oculoplastics. Here we yeah, go. Leave, start surgery. The old debate, the old debate used to be that in these young children, that if you just relieved it, you don't necessarily need a prosthesis in, and that the, the tissues would often bounce back. And, and uh, so where are we in regards to that debate? Is it, is it there's still those who feel that you can just relieve these and not have to put a prosthesis or essentially is sticking in something um, always happening with these pediatric young trapdoor injuries? Absolutely. So in, in those fractures where there's a true trapdoor, right. The, and this is why it's really, this is why I always say to you, send me a copy of the scans. You have to look at the scans yourself. Don't rely on the radiology report. It's no fault of the radiologist. You should spend the day with the radiologist and see what they have to read, everything from head to toe. And these are things that are often missed. So if you have a true tap, trap door fracture, I tend to release it, do a post obstruction test on the table, and then decide whether to put it in. If there is an open space, then I will put a thin, yeah. thinner implant than usual. 
But that, that <coughs> implies you don't always need an implant. And we mustn't forget putting a porous foreign body in the orbit it carries a certain amount right, of right, right. infection and so on. And one of the things you didn't bring up is anytime you see a fracture in someone less than 16, the definition of children is variable from country to country. Below 16, the thing to look for is cut gaze. If you see any evidence of them closing their eyes as they look up, in our case, or they get nausea. Nausea is a, an indication for immediate surgery. That's where you get entrapment with pulling on the innervation of the inferior rectus, which gives you that phase away from the response. Um, if you get sublimitation, I disagree with that 24-hour rule. There is a tendency in oculoplastics to operate, operate too quickly. Many of these patients will have a bruised muscle and the movement goes back to normal within 24, 48 hours. So what Dr. Olson is talking about in the old days, they used to say, observe them for two weeks. It's not necessarily true that you have to wait a few two weeks, but do allow the edema from trauma. And if you're not sure, just have somebody hit you really hard on one biceps and then carry two heavy pails. Within an hour or two hours, you can carry them equally well, but the first few hours, you're not able to. The muscle does get bruised. So I think this early surgery, remember, if you operate on them quickly, you'll never find out how many of them could have gotten better. And this is where Congress's papers from the 1960s and 70s are very useful. They actually followed these patients without doing surgery. The problem with their papers is the mixture of adults and children. And the Indian paper you mentioned, which, which I happen to review, is a very good paper, but some of the objections there were some of them had surgery too soon, even with very slight limitation of movement the so-called fractal fracture. So you'll never find out if that child could have gotten better or not. Finally, don't forget finances. The minute you take a patient like this to surgery, from start to finish, pre or post-op visits, costs come to something like forty-five to fifty thousand dollars in this country. And it's really important not to operate on children who don't need surgery. So my approach with these is if you have nausea, I operate on them immediately. If they have any kind of a basal vagal response, with or without nausea, I operate on them immediately. Otherwise, I give them anything up to a week and then decide whether the surgery is <coughs> This way you avoid unnecessary surgery. We have a large series, and I think what we will do is we will pull all our papers, because the number of patients that I don't operate on is very substantial. So we should be able to uh, review the paper on this. Thank you. Thank you.